So welcome, 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 David. We greatly appreciate your leadership. As always, we begin all things by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We also acknowledge all our ancestors. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all the elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So please, David, introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers and tell us about your remarkable work. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Victor, and and thanks for that beautiful uh, acknowledgement. That's uh, that's great. I um, yeah, I'm so I'm David O'Leary. I am a founder of of Kind Wealth and principal at Kind Wealth, and and I'm building out that as a wealth advisory practice, working with high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals and families, uh, uh, providing a family office service. So working with uh, them to create a wealth strategy and and work with their other professionals in their lives to ensure that their money does what they, you know, what they want it to do for them and accomplish all their goals. But with a particular focus on how do we um, get people to think more strategically about the wealth, the impact that they can have with their wealth in, in a, a variety of different facets. So whether that's how they spend, how they save and invest, or how they give money away. Um, and my background just before that very quickly was I, I spent a few years uh, running the impact investing uh, arm of World Vision Canada. So I'll leave that intro at that. <laughs> Thank you so much for your leadership. Um, as always, we really appreciate you. In our last conversation, you made um, an insightful point. You spoke about creating a sense of community amongst your clients. What inspires you most about your work right now? Yeah, I, it's really... so. I'm very interested in the the aspects of of a creating a community amongst the clients. I think that the idea of making a positive impact with your wealth can be greatly enhanced if we do it in a in a communal sense and work together with others. And whether that's um, learning, you know, from their experiences and insights that they've gained, maybe because they've been doing impact investing for longer, and you've got a newer client who gets to hear and learn from somebody else who's done it, not just from their advisor who's telling them about it, but another a client who's actually done it before and had that experience, but also you know, for inspiration about what else is out there and what's possible and hearing and meeting other people in the ecosystem. You know, When I learned about it, it took me time to get involved and make connections in the ecosystem. And as you do, you just start to feel more part of a community, you get inspiration, encouragement and support. And so that is one aspect I'm really excited about. And the other aspect is is um, is helping people understand their own um, money mindset, money attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. There's this idea in finance, I think that I grew up with certainly that you know your money decisions should be unemotional and thoughtful and just you know everything sort of you know, robotic. It's it's a math exercise, and there's no room you know don't get emotional about your money and I think that's just a really unhelpful, quite frankly, a harmful view of, of money. Money is highly emotional. It's tied up in our hopes and fears and dreams. Um, and, and a lot of us, I think, uh, over time, especially you know, growing up, sometimes uh, can run into, I think, some harmful um, views and, and the way they relate with money can sometimes be harmful and even detrimental to themselves. And so I'm, I'm very interested in exploring that with our clients and helping them unpack and uncover their own, uh, you know, money, we call them money scripts, these sort of stories we tell ourselves about money that may not be true or may not be helpful. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And thank you so much for your candor. So that's a perfect segue to my next question. What challenges and barriers do you face in your work? And what are some of the strategies you use to overcome them? Yeah, a lot of a lot of challenges. I mean, we're we're so from I think two major aspects. One is what we're trying to build out is um, uses a very different model than the rest of the investment and wealth advisory industry. So the industry is really built upon if you manage clients' investments for them, you typically would take some percentage of their investments as a fee for, um, you know, for, for providing advice. And what often happens is, uh, A, it creates some conflicts of interest. So if your client has desires to give away their money <laughs> and you get paid by how much they invest with you, you don't have a whole lot of financial incentive to help them give away their money effectively. You really want to encourage them to keep investing more um, that's one, you know, one really pronounced example. Um, 
So we're, we, we pioneering a different model where, you know, we don't manage our client assets and we are paid for the advice that we provide. Um, and that provides some more independence so that no matter, you know, what we tell them to do with their money, we're not going to make more or less because of it. The clients can feel sure that like, Hey, they're giving us their advice. It's not because they're going to make more money. It's because they think it's in our best interest. But anytime you kind of have a new approach and a new model, you've got to create awareness about it. People have to get familiar and comfortable with it. And so that's a bit of a challenge to try to fly in the face of the way the rest of the industry, um, you know, works. And then the other aspect I think is this idea of getting, reducing the talk action gap for I'm talking about wanting to make an impact with my investments, but how much have I actually, you know, directed dollars, whether again, that's giving money away or making investments with a um, impact investments and that, reducing that talk action gap is, is challenging and partly why we talked about the community aspect, I think can be helpful for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd love to learn a little bit more about your virtual family office and just your perspective on the future of impact investing in Canada. Um, your background working at World Vision um, Canada and the impact investing portfolio. I'd love your insights because as you know, we have the social finance fund that's just been launched. We have a lot of fund managers in the ecosystem and there's an emerging fund manager. So I'd love to hear your insights on what does the future of impact investing look like in Canada? It's a great question. Uh, I will share best I can. Uh, I certainly don't have a crystal ball, but I, I think that um, there's still a lot of where we've seen the most traction for, for people who are willing to make an impact investment. I still think that there's, it comes from a place of I'll start with some of my philanthropic dollars. These are this money I would have been giving away anyway. And so if the investment doesn't pay the type of rate of return that I might otherwise be hoping for from an investment and or doesn't work out, I will consider it a donation. And so, you know, no problem. And I, I don't think that's a bad place to start. It certainly is very reasonable, but it's not where we want to be, right? We don't want to be cannibalizing philanthropic dollars. We will certainly want to encourage people to give more and more away. And I think there's the harmful notion i hope i'm hoping that this is starting to go away in impact investing circles that impact investing is superior to philanthropy and will replace it one day um i think that it's suitable what i think the magic of it is that it allows us to to not use philanthropic dollars for for things that don't require philanthropy right so i think about hey if we're interested in creating good jobs um, and stimulating small business growth you know investments are a great way to do that um, whereas if we're talking about disaster relief, oh, you know, setting up an investment opportunity is not at all suitable. We need relief money, you know, as soon as possible. And so uh, this idea of how do we think more strategically about, I have, I have certain dollars to use and which dollars are best directed for what purpose and cause is, is where I'd like to get. But I still think there's, um, we're very focused on, Hey, I'm going to use my philanthropic dollars as experimental money for impact investing. And we really, I haven't seen a whole lot of people get much beyond that just yet. And so I'm hopeful that we can get into these conversations with our clients, help them understand that different dollars can be directed more beneficially to different purposes so that they are more strategic about that. And so that's, that's part of, I think the, the challenge. I, I hope that that's the direction we're heading. I think it's just, unfortunately going to be a long journey and I'll just quickly say, I kind of draw parallels from if we looked at the ESG, SRI, socially responsible investing trajectory. I mean, for most of my career, I had heard about it when I was a, in my late teens, early 20s. I was working at a bank. I heard about this firm ethical funds in Canada here. And that was the first time I heard of the concept. And then, it, you know, for most of my career, it was this sort of yeah, these sort of hippie tree huggers over here do this stuff. And, you know, sometimes we get some religious foundations that care about this stuff, but it was just sort of the side thing that wasn't paid a lot of attention to. It was only really in the past, is it five, six, seven years where we've just seen, you know, a real explosion in the interest. And so what that sort of tells you, I think, is that you can kind of go through this really, unfortunately, long period of time to build momentum. And then you sort of hit a tipping point and it starts to take off. And I hope for that that's shorter with impact investing, but I worry that it's longer than, than maybe most people are expecting. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I agree completely. When you look at the, the, the curve around social purpose, or even just, even now, the backlash against ESGs south of the border, um, what's your perspectives on just on greenwashing in, in the ecosystem? 
Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I think I think there certainly is greenwashing that happens, right? Or just irresponsible marketing that is exaggerating that you know the the the, the benefits and what's what's go actually happening, and that needs to be clamped down on it. I think there's also maybe an equal portion, or if not equal, it's still a significant portion that comes from a misunderstanding. So if we're talking about ESG or SRI, that, that there's a lot of different ways to practice that. Um, so it's, for some people, it's I don't want any dollars in any industry that I consider harmful or un, unhelpful. Um, and for others, they say, well, no, I want to have my dollars in the companies that are uh, the leaders in the space that are doing the most to try to enact change. And and um, so if we're talking about, you know, I won't have any money in any oil company versus hey, I want these oil companies because they are leading the, the charge on sort of the clean energy revolution and trying to transition their businesses. And I don't think there's a right or wrong to that. But if you go in expecting that ESG means that you won't have any dollars in anything that you consider, then of course you're going to go, oh, it's greenwashing because look, they own these oil companies. Well, that, it's just it may just be a different philosophy or approach, right? Or shareholder. I can't be an active shareholder if I don't own a position in the company. So we're going to own a position so that we can engage management and get them to hopefully change their their practices so that misunderstanding i think is unfortunately responsible for some percentage of the greenwashing claims absolutely thank you so much for that i remember um, last time we had a, a great conversation your eyes lit up when you spoke about educating families you work with a lot of high net worth individuals like how does it feel to just educate families and, and support them in terms of new mindsets and um new narratives around how they engage with their wealth or the creation of intergenerational wealth yeah, so very rewarding. I mean, that's the aspect of of what we what we do at Kind Wealth that I most excited about. <laughs> My, the, the, but it sort of isn't what we necessarily always lead with in our marketing, because everyone's at a different stage of their journey, right? Um, you know, if you looked at me fifteen, you know, ten, even ten years ago, well, probably twelve years ago now, I, you know, I just wasn't in the same headspace and wasn't anywhere, you know close to where I am kind of in my journey now and I'm still on a journey. Uh, and so I don't like to judge people in terms of like, you know, where they're at in that journey. They may have just a bit of an interest or they're open to it. They like the idea of it, but there's still a lot of discomfort. So it's rewarding because you get this opportunity to do this. It can be very frustrating though, because it's, I've, I've have, you know, whatever number of years now, this like probably on, the, on this journey for, for 12 years or so now. And, and it, it's taken me a long time to, wrap my head around different aspects to really see opportunities and and how do I get you know, somebody thinking with that mindset they need to they need to take their own journey I can share with them all the lessons and the insights I've gained but it's not the same thing as you coming to those on your own so hopefully I can speed their journey up but the frustrating part is that I am impatient and I want it to happen faster and I've had to you know do a lot to really recognize that that you can't rush people along that journey you you, you it's it's that balance finding the balance between like you know supporting and encouraging and pushing it but not rushing it and forcing it on somebody who's not ready to to, to do that yet and you and i think that can be very counterproductive if you put somebody in a position they're not ready to because they kind of forced into it and they have a bad experience i think we want to avoid those those situations because you might get them the backlash to it absolutely what role do you feel government or the public sector should play in the impact investing ecosystem, if any at all? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think in spirit, a lot of what the, the roles that it has been talking about and starting to to, to play. So I, I think providing funding um, to create, you know, for, for those areas of the ecosystem that require it. Um, so, you know, whether that's capacity building for small businesses and that early, early stage funding that investors don't typically want to step in and, and fill that role, I think can certainly be very, very helpful. So what we're seeing with the social finance fund, I think the, you know, building up the intermediaries, I think all those things are, are helpful. I think education and awareness is, is really like if we're talking about, I think it depends also like who we're talking about. So if we're talking about it entering the zeitgeist and, and the, and the, and the average or even you know, above average in terms of wealth and accumulation, like, but the, the person who's not the industry expert for them to start to become aware about it and excited about it and, and become less apprehensive about it. I think it just needs to be, you know, the more awareness and the more that just enters the everyday lexicon, I think that helps reduce people's 
worries and anxieties about it. It makes it more entrenched, more established rather than this sort of, well, I've heard about that niche thing that these other people do, you know, it feels more common and more that it's happening more. So I think government education and awareness um, can be a big part of it as well, but. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more, thank you. So my last some couple of questions are the hardest. Okay. Um, you run a remarkable um, platform where you engage leaders in the impact investing space uh, across Turtle Islands, across North America, um, actually maybe even internationally. I want to know your favorite guest and your favorite interview. Oh boy, that's a tough yeah, one. A hard one. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've got, I've, I've really got so many, and that sounds like such a cop out. Um, so can I give you just a few? Um, yeah, absolutely. And and this is, you know, there's there's so many that I loved. Um, I would say so. One of the um, trying to think where to start. So Jed Emerson was a great interview. Um, Jed, we were talking about his book, The Purpose of Capital. It's deeply philosophical. Um, it was a very difficult read. I had to wrestle with a lot of the concepts and stop and slow down. And so getting to talk to Jed about the book when it was a book that meant a lot to me personally and that I wrestled with a lot of the concepts and getting to hear his thoughts on it was a highlight for me. Um, Sir Ronald Cohen, certainly because of his you know, stature in the industry and, and all that. Um, uh, I had uh, another interview um, with uh, John Lekomnik and that was from the financial theory side of things. So like the CFA financial nerd in me got to nerd out with him on you know, modern portfolio theory and the challenges with, um, you know, how that leads us, steers us away from, you know, being open to and considering sustainable and ESG investing when, you know, his argument is that it's flawed and that we actually need to, you know, it's provable that it's flawed and we need to kind of adapt it. Anyway, so getting to nerd out on financial theory was another, was another highlight for me, but I, I've, loved every episode and that sounds like such a cliche but it's absolutely true because you hear about people i part of the episodes are just tell me about how you got involved in this space and what your journey was to get to where you are now and i find that stuff endlessly fascinating because everybody's journey is so unique absolutely absolutely and, and this is my final question before just calls to action or any closing thoughts when all is said and done on david o'leary's tombstone what do you what do you what, what do you want to say about oh, you man. and that's such a great yeah. but this is a question we ask our clients and I never I, I, I still don't have a great answer for it myself um I, I would overwhelmingly I would love it to say that you know I was somebody who you know certainly was you know made mistakes wasn't perfect but but tried their best and wanted to to give back to others and wanted to make a positive impact and and was generous with their with their time and their expertise and and, and knowledge and I, I do try to you know carve out that time to just like share with others and connect with others and so i if if people kind of recognized and and thought of me as somebody who was trying their best uh, that would that'd be good enough for me you know um so it, not necessarily about like the outcomes so hard to we talk about outputs versus outcomes in this industry right mm -hmm. and the outcomes and in, in my case i are they're so like i i'd love it to be as big as possible but if it, people even just recognize the outputs, you know, and the effort that I put in, I'd be happy with that. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough, indeed, indeed. So do you have any closing thoughts or call to actions to our listeners and viewers? Yeah, I mean, I would say, I, I think the, you know, the more that we can, all of us have a role that we can play, um, you know, and even if you're just starting out, you know, and uh, in, in not you know, super kind of integrated into this, this world yet, uh, it's a very welcoming place. Uh, it's one of the things I love about it as compared to the traditional investment industry, which is very competitive and no one's out there looking to help you get off your your your, uh, your, your feet under you. This industry is very different. There's a lot of uh, supportive people. So just get out, get involved. You can figure out what you're good at and find a way to contribute that to the industry because we there's a lot of help that is needed to keep this ball, you know, the kind of the momentum going. So uh, I'd say that, um, you know, for folks who are, um, you know, business owners have complex finances and want help with this, Kind Wealth is a, is a resource. There are others out there as well. So if we're not a good fit for you, you know, we can certainly help or you can find others out there in the industry that are. There's just lots of great um, people and organizations in this industry. So 
maybe a little bit um, um, generic, but um, I don't know exactly who the who the listeners are to the, the the you know to this right now, so it's hard to give more specific advice than that. But but I'd say yeah, just go out there, and that's that's kind of what I did, and it and I found everybody very what, receptive and welcoming to to educate sharing education and experience. That's incredible. That's incredible. I really appreciate you, David. And we'll close the way we began this interview by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We acknowledge all our ancestors. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you so much, David. We really appreciate you. Thank you.